Hello everyone. Uh, welcome you all to the, our webinar series. Uh, today, uh, Professor Pete Smith from University of Aberdeen is going to uh, give a presentation on quantitative methods for model evaluation. Um, I, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Pete Smith for kindly agreeing, uh, even though he's very in his busy schedule. Um, and he's, he generally needs no introduction. He's very eminent personality in, um, in the area of um, carbon dynamics and modeling. So hope you enjoy this presentation today. Uh, I will leave the floor to uh, Professor Pete Smith. Thanks, Thanks very much, Jagadish. So, so hopefully everyone can see the screen. If anyone can't see my screen, please just um, shout. No? Okay. So I've not done a webinar before, so I don't know if I'm doing it properly or not. So if you've got any questions, just shout. Okay, so we've been asked to talk about um, how to evaluate a model today. So what I'm going to mainly talk about are the methods that we described in the book, Environmental Modeling and Introduction, which was published in 2007. Um, I'm going to talk about three things, I guess. So firstly, why is it important? Firstly, we do quantitative analysis to see how confident we can be in the model outputs. We then need to see how the model behaves, and to do that we do a sensitivity analysis. And thirdly, we want to know which components are important in determining how the model produces its outputs. And to do that we look at an uncertainty analysis. Okay, so let's look first at quantitative analysis. So how confident can we be in the results? Well, there are two aspects to this. There's coincidence and association. Hang on a moment. Jack, if you can possibly mute your microphone. If you can mute your microphone. Okay, that's better. So I think that's reduced the echo a bit now. You were hearing me both through my microphone and Jagadish's microphone. So um, much better. Right, good. Okay, so um, firstly, there's coincidence and there's also association. So let's just get these up on screen so that we can show the difference. So both of these um, are showing different aspects of model performance. So the first one is showing that the model is sort of quite close um, but uh, we're actually getting the wrong trend, so the shape is wrong. With the second one, we're uh, labeled association, we're showing that the, we're getting the right trend, but we're off. There's a significant um, overestimation of the estimates there. So in the first one, we've got high coincidence but low association. And in the second case, we've got low coincidence but high association. So we can try and test each of these independently. What we actually want, if we want to be confident in the models, when we plot um, changes over time or if we plot modeled versus measured, is we want to see high coincidence and high association. So basically all of our um, modeled estimates fall on top of the measured estimates. That never happens in reality, of course, but that's what we'd like to do to show that the model is working well. In terms of a sensitivity analysis, what we're really looking at is how the model behaves. And we need to do this if we're going to look at, um, if we're going to use the model to try and predict into the future or outside the situations under which it's been strictly tested. So what we're really looking for is we're looking for the behavior of the model to changes in the inputs. So if you've got a, a, an input that has a very, very, very big impact on the outputs, then the model would be sensitive to that parameter. And we can do that in one of two ways. We can either use uh, local sensitivity analysis or global sensitivity analysis. And I'll come on to that a little bit later in the talk. And we can use a couple of methods for that. Well, there are a whole bunch of methods we could use. 
Um, but one method is to use a grid search where you go through and you, you change parameter values within an expected range. Or the second one is you define a probability distribution or a probability density function for the individual inputs or to the internal parameters. And you then select randomly within those and this is good for the global uncertainty analysis where you can select a whole range of plausible parameter values or input values, which then you look at and see how the model is sensitive to those in terms of the outputs. And the last one, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is which components of the model are important. So we do this with an uncertainty analysis. So it differs from a sensitivity analysis in that it tells us um, what's important in terms of determining the model outputs. So you could have a parameter that's, or, or uh, an, an input to which the model is very sensitive. But if that has very little impact on the outcome of the model, then it would not be important. So the sensitivity analysis, it differs from the uncertainty analysis. And we need the uncertainty analysis to show us which parts of the model are most uncertain and which have the biggest importance, the largest importance in terms of the output. So similarly to the sensitivity analysis, we can adjust those components across a range of the uncertainty. We can do that through Monte Carlo, we can do it through grid search, and that determines the impact of the input uncertainty on the output. So I'll try and cover the quantitative analysis, the sensitivity analysis, and the uncertainty analysis in this little uh, webinar today. So in summary, if we want to know how confident we can be in the results, and this is usually the first step that we do, is we test the model to, to check um, that we're matching relatively well with the measured data. That's the quantitative analysis. We see how the model behaves with the sensitivity analysis, and then we see which components are the most important using an uncertainty analysis. So the most important thing when we're testing model accuracy is to test against independent data. So when you're creating a model or when you're adapting a model, you often take some data and you use it to improve or to calibrate the model. And there's no point in then testing the model against that same data because it's not an independent test. So an important part for evaluating model accuracy is to make sure that you've got a separate set of independent data. So ideally, this would be from a different site entirely. But if you can't find data from a different site, then you can bootstrap the data in some way so that's just another way of saying that you can take a subset of that data, maybe from calibrating on one year and testing it um, for a couple of years that haven't been used in the calibration. Or you may um, calibrate it on one plot and then test the model on a bunch of other plots with different, um, different experimental treatments. So we can only really use data that's not been used in model development. And we can only test the balance of processes um, included by changing the simulation conditions. And we do that by using these independent um, data to test the model. So let's have a look first. Firstly, we, we take the independent data and then we plot the measured and simulated results. The first thing we all do, of course, is we have a quick look at the results. There's no point in going and doing a full um, numerical analysis if you find out you've made a, made a mistake in the input files and you've just got a flat line where you're expecting um, a lot of peaks or you've got a lot of peaks where you're expecting a flat line. So the first thing obviously to do before you do all the quantitative and numerical analysis is to take a quick look at the results and to check that your model is, is doing the right thing, to check that you haven't made a mistake. So you might have a few iterations of this when you're, when you're modeling. Um, I'm sure that you've all come across this. You've run the model two or three times before you get anything that looks correct. You go through and you find out what the mistakes are, and then you can run the model. And then when you think you've got somewhere close, that's the time to then go on to the numerical analysis. So the other thing that it tells us is what the likely sources of error are. So it tells us what to expect. So we know, for example, if, say we're looking at nitrous oxide emissions, we know that that's anaerobic conditions are important in that. So if we're getting the nitrous oxide wrong, we might go away and have a look at, firstly, we'd, we, we'd go away and have a look and check that we're getting the, the soil water uh, estimates correct. So 
so having plotted them and checked it, that we've checked that we've got the um, that we're in the right ballpark, we've got the measured and the simulated results. We can then use statistics to quantify what we see, and we can use alternative plots to investigate this further. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those. And then if we improve the model as a result of this round of testing, then we need to test against different independent measurements in the future. So we can't just keep on assimilating the data and then just checking them against the same data and saying, there, we do a good job, because we're obviously uh, using the same data to calibrate the model, and that's not good practice. We need to show that it's performing well under independent conditions. So a number of plots are available to show the accuracy of the data. So the first one that a lot of people do is they plot the simulated values against the measured values and then see how well these compare to the one-to-one one -one line. And immediately you can see whether you're significantly over-predicting or significantly <coughs> under-predicting um, the, the measured values. So if you were um, consistently above the line in this region, the simulated values are higher than the measured values, you're over-predicting. And if the measured values are bigger than the simulated values, you would get more of these points falling below the line. The other thing that we can do, if we know some of the measurement error, is we can put the measurement errors onto these plots and see if we're doing OK. So you can see there's a bit of scatter around the one-to-one -one line here, but it's all within the measurement error. So there's a measurement error here associated both um, with in the X, the X dimension and in the Y dimension. And we can use this to test if the model's fitting well. So a good fit is if the experimental error overlaps with a one-to-one -one line. So even without doing any statistics, we can tell that we're doing reasonably well with the model. But even better, we should try to quantify this. So how do we know if we've got a good fit? Well, the first estimate, the first way of doing this is using an average error. So there's a, a, a metric um, which was published by Logan Green in 1991 called the root mean squared deviation, or RMS, which is, um, works by taking all of the, the um, simulated values, P, I, and all of the measured values, O, I, and you subtract the um, simulated value, you subtract the observed value from the simulated value, giving you the difference, you tend to then take the square of that because then that cancels out any pluses or minuses so that you're just dealing with the absolute deviation. And you then sum those up and you divide it by the number of paired observations that you've got or the number of samples that you've got. And this gives you a good um, estimate of the error of the model. That gives you a sort of an average error. So this is the root mean square deviation or RMS and if you just take a careful note of this bit, the P, PI minus OI, so this is all your pairs of um, uh, simulated value, predicted versus observed, predicted value one minus observed one, predicted value two minus observed number two, et cetera, et cetera, the sum of those squared um, to get rid of the pluses or minuses. So this is a, this is a good measure to look at your average error. A variation on this is just to convert this into a sort of a percentage. So this is exactly the same equation. We'll go back to the previous one. This is the previous uh, equation. Um, compare that to the what we're doing here. We're then just um, uh, looking at this um, deviation by putting the um, observed mean value, the mean measured value, over 100 to convert this into a, into a percentage. So this is basically the same as the root mean deviation, or RMS, um, to give you a root mean squared error. And this just puts the, the values into um, percentages so that that's common then across all of the metrics that you're measuring. So whether you're measuring tons of carbon, grams of nitrogen, um, uh, micrograms of some micronutrient, all of those could then be compared in the same way because we're we're making them proportional to the, the mean measured value that we're trying to simulate. So these are good estimates um, of error, um, average error for the model. So what we're trying to do when we're trying to get a model to fit well 
is we're trying to minimize the RMS or the RMSE, whichever measure we use. But then we need to we need to find out how much error is acceptable. So one way to do that is to just have an acceptable error. So for example, if you're doing nitrogen fertilization, um, maybe an acceptable error is within, say, 10 or 20 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare because the spreader that you're using only has that level of accuracy. So there's no point in trying to simulate something um, which has a much greater accuracy than you're able to apply in, 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 um, in the real world. So one way of determining acceptable error is to, is to look at the, the real world application, which I'll come on to in a moment. And another way is to assess what the, um, what the, the natural variation is within the population that you're trying to simulate. So we've got these accuracy of simulations here, where we've got the experimental and overlapping with the one-to-one -one line. Um, but we then want to compare either the RMS or the RMSE with the experimental error. So within the, within the measurements, we'll have a frequency distribution of, of those measurement errors. So when we're trying to measure a specific thing, we've got a mean value and we've got a standard deviation or a standard error. And most, most of this will fit within the 95% of the population. So if we're outside this part of the population, the statistical norms have been exceeded, and we say that this, these values probably don't belong to the same population. So basically, we're just trying to fit the model so that it fits within this value. We often only have a mean, but if we've got standard errors or standard deviations, we can check that the model is fitting at least within this probability density distribution of the measurements. Okay, so we've already seen this. This is the Logan Green average error, which tells us the, um, how well the model is fitting compared to the observations, the predicted versus the observations. But now we can test it against the 95% confidence interval for that data. So what we do on the, let's go back to the previous one, what we can define here is we can define the critical threshold beyond which these um, measurements would not be regarded as being part of the same statistical population. So this is the critical T value. So we use that critical T value here, the T times the standard error squared to define the range that we might expect among the measured values. So if our model fits within the, the uh, our modeled or predicted values fit within that distribution of the 95% confidence interval of the measurements, then we can't really do much more. So the data is, um, is only able to um, disprove that the model is having a good fit if, it's, um, if we have a fairly tight distribution and the model is then fitting outside those 95% confidence intervals. So we use that student's T value from the 95% confidence interval we use the standard error, and then that defines the RMSE 95. So once we know the 95% confidence interval, we compare our estimate of RMS, the root mean square deviation, to see if it fits within those boundaries. So a good fit happens if the RMS is equal to or less than RMS 95. And RMS 95 is defined by the, uh, by the measurements. Okay, but to do that, we need the standard errors. So if we've just got a list of data which just give us some mean estimates from a plot, then we can't easily do this. So we do need the standard error. But if we've got the standard error, because we, we know the variation in the measurements that were taken to make up a given estimate, then we can do this RMSC 95. So this is just put in for students when we're talking to students. When we're reporting the results, we need to tell a clear story. We need to keep it succinct. We need to present graphs that help us to tell that story. We need to use the statistics to quantify what you see. And I bet you still review papers where people say the model fit is good 
and they just show a graph and there is no quantification whatsoever. And if you're anything like me, you find that really annoying and you want it to be quantified to some extent at least. So you want to see the graphs, but you also want to see the statistics showing that you have um, a, an acceptable model error. And then the other thing is to only quote the most robust statistics. And also, obviously, when we're talking to students, we only, only want to use an appropriate number of decimal places. Often you'll see papers that report to three or four significant figures when the model and the measurements do not justify that. So obviously we need to keep, keep it real in terms of the number of decimal places that we report. I was expecting a bit more on uncertainty analysis. Let me get back. Let's see if I can find it. I've just killed the computer. Yeah, here we go. So I think I've just uh, pressed the wrong button here. Here we go. Let's go back. Everybody's still with me? Good. Right. The other thing to do, as I mentioned earlier, is to use um, an acceptable error. So this is where we know what the acceptable error is. So if we know that we can only apply fertilizers at a certain, with a certain level of accuracy, or we know that we can only measure something with a certain level of accuracy, we can directly insert the acceptable error into here and compare the RMS value with the acceptable error. And again, a good fit here is when the RMS is less than the RMS acceptable, and this is defined um, by the user. So another useful statistic, so that's talking about error. Another useful quanti quantitative statistic is low fit, or the lack of fit, which was published by Whitmore um, in 1991. And this excludes, excludes the noise in the experimental data. So with the previous statistics that we've been talking about, like RMS or RMSE, if the um, measurement data is very noisy, we, it's difficult to test the model. Sometimes the data is not, um, is, is not of sufficient quality to test the model because it's too variable. But what this does, if we have the actual replicate values, not just the standard error, but we've got the individual replicate values, is we can use low fit, which compares the lack of fit compared to the, um, the predicted values here, P, J, um, compared to the observed values, but it takes account of the variability within the measurements. So it's a way of factoring out the measurement error. So we, we, what it allows us to do is we use an F-test to work out the, uh, the probability that the simulated and measured populations are not statistically significant. So we're using an F-test there. So as an example here, we've got for 60 samples, for a probability of 5%, the F value that we'll be looking at is 1.96, and the, for a probability of 1, we'll be looking for a value of 2.58. So because we're including the, the, um, the observation error, so we've got a sum here of the observation errors, we're using this to factor out the, the um, variation in the observations or the measurements and we're then able to compare the, the model um, to assess the model um, variation after the measurement variation has been accounted for. So what we're doing here is um, we've got the simulated data. We're showing a reasonably good plot, but we've got a couple of outliers. And uh, the low fit will tell us if those outliers are having a large influence on the result. But when we look, when we plot this, we'll be able to see this from just making a plot. We investigate the reasons for those outliers. So are those outliers because we've got a strange measurement? Is it because we've got less replicates? Is it because it was a particularly hot or cold day upon which the measurements were taken? So we can go back and we can investigate those reasons. 
So examples, different environment, different time of year. Um, we can pr plot a subset of the results, excluding all points from the conditions from the outlier subset, or we can use them and include them in the um, in the analysis. But if we are to exclude them, then we need good readings for excluding them, and then we can quote the results for that subset, stating the boundaries under which the analysis took place. Okay. The other one that we can look at is is bias, or so we've looked here at average error. We've looked that was with RMS and with RMSE. Then we've used LOFIT to look at model error compared to measurement error, having factored out the measurement error. Um, but we can also look for bias. So if we've instead of plotting something like this, we plot something like this. We've also got high experimental error, but we're showing a consistent bias here in the model. There's a significant shift. Um, towards um, with higher measured values and lower simulated values. So we got a significant under prediction of the model when we try to plot this on the one to one line. So going back to that um, uh, correlation and association, uh, coincidence and association, here we've got um, a high um, association but a low coincidence. So just the standard sample correlation coefficient R can be used to determine association. So you'll all be used to see this. You can do this automatically in Excel. You can basically do it using any statistical package. And what this does is it checks for the association between the measurements. So here we would have a very high R squared value. We'd have a very high level of association, even though we've got significant under or over prediction. So R, the sample correlation coefficient, is used. And we can compare that, again, using the F-statistic, because a short format of the F-statistic uses the correlation coefficient. So N minus 2 times R squared over 1 minus R squared um, gives us the F-statistic. And we can compare that statistic, again, to the F-lookup table at probabilities of 5% or 1% with the values given at the bottom. So if the F statistic is higher than those, then we have significant association. If it's lower, then we have non-significant. Statistically, we have non-significant uh, correlation. OK. So the measurements here are showing the same trends, but we've got high experimental error. And there's this systematic shift. So we want to know if that bias is significant. So we can use something like the relative error here. So again, we're seeing a similar use of the, the values. We've got the observed values minus the predicted values are summed, divided by each individual value of the observation. And then these are converted in the same way as we do with RMSE into a sort of a percentage value. Because we're not doing the root mean square error of this, so it's a bit similar to RMSE, but because we're not doing squaring it and then taking the square root, all of the negative and values, all the negative values and the positive values go into the analysis. So because we're allowing negative and positive values into the analysis, this then gives us an estimate of whether those, whether there are more positive values or more negative values being included. And this gives us an estimate of the bias. So in exactly the same way as we compare to RMS95, we can compare to E95. So we plot out the, the standard errors. If we know the standard error of the measurements, we can use the t-statistic and the, the standard error of the measurements to calculate a 95% confidence interval. And we can compare our E value. That's the, the, um, the relative error, E. We can compare that to the 95% confidence interval for that relative error. And if it's within those values, then the model is performing acceptably. If it's outside those values, then there is a significant bias, which, which is not good, obviously, for the model. So there's a significant bias if E is greater than E95. And that's showing a systematic shift. In this case, it's below the line, but that could equally be above the line. And that's telling us where we've got a systematic bias within the model. 
Okay, so what we then do is we can then plot the simulated versus measured data against an input. So this is just a time series here. This is showing the measured values as the points with the errors shown. And our model here is under predicting. So we're getting a reasonable trend. It's going up where it's meant to go up. It's going down when it's meant to go down. But we're not capturing the peaks. The amplitude of the peaks is not captured. So here we're showing a significant error where the model is under predicting what the measurements are telling us it should be. OK, so the response of the process is correct, but it's the magnitude or the amplitude that's wrong. OK, so that's telling us about the association. So now what happens if we're getting this sort of pattern? What this tells us is that we, we've got the wrong magnitude, perhaps, but multiple processes are going wrong here because we're not fitting this one-to-one -one line. So here we're getting a significant underprediction. And here we're getting a significant overprediction, and you can see that there's a significant difference here between the slope of the lines. So here we're getting a difference between uh, the measured and the modelled values. So if we start to get plots like this, we know that we're in <laughs> we know that we're in some trouble with uh, with getting a good model fit. And of course, it's when the model goes wrong that we learn. This is where the science comes in. This is where we go back and we re-examine the model. And once we, once we determine that we haven't made any mistakes, that then allows us to go back to improve the model by inc including or improving processes that haven't been included or that aren't described well. But this is the sort of thing that tells us when we've got more than one thing going wrong. This is not just an underprediction. We've got something seriously going wrong with the model here. Another example is where we get this sort of plot. So we plot the simulated values against the measured values, um, and the response seems to be wrong. So we're just we're missing out a process somewhere here in the model. There's something going on that we're not capturing because we're getting some significant under predictions and over predictions. And we might find this if we plot the time series of the simulated values against the measured values. What we're showing here is we're actually getting quite a good simulation. So the magnitude is round about right. This peak is round about where it should be. And this peak is round about where it should be. But we've got a delay in the onset of the process. So this could be something like where we've got the crop phenology wrong, where we um, have um, a start time for the simulation, which is wrong because we've initialized it, for example, with an incorrect maybe we've taken the first day when it's not freezing to initialize the model but we should be using something different so we sometimes see these sorts of trends where we've just got a temporal shift which is giving us um, giving us reasonable model behavior but the processes are occurring at the wrong time and this is particularly important with cumulative processes okay so we might get this sort of this sort of values where the process is occurring um, uh, at the wrong rate. So again, we can plot the results to see um, where, where the model's going wrong. OK, so in terms of model accuracy um, of the simulations, we've got a sort of a flow diagram that I've tried to take you through very quickly today. And I appreciate that for some of you, this will be telling you what you already do every single day. I think you know exactly what, how to do this, so it won't be of value. And for some people who have not followed the mathematics or the statistics, it will have been much too fast. But this will be available afterwards, and we, you can also take a look at the, the chapter where this is described in detail in the book. And it was also described in the, the Geoderma paper that was published way back in 1997. These methods are described there. So just to summarize then, we plot the results first and we check to see if they're OK. Then we can have a look and see if we've got coincidence. So are the simulations a good fit to the measurements? If we've got replica values available, we can then test the error. So we can test for two things. We can test for systematic error, and we can compare that to the measurement error, and we do that with the low fit statistic if we've got the replicates available. 
that's a great statistic. So the low fit statistic is perhaps the most stringent test that we can give the model. So if we've got all the replicate values from the measurements, let's use low fit. It's a great statistic. If we don't have that, well, firstly, what happens if it's statistically significant? We calculate F. I'm going to come on to that in a moment. If there aren't me uh, replicate measurements available, then we can use the total error. So we either calculate RMS, the root mean square deviation, or RMSE, the root mean square error. That's the percentage one. And then we're looking at total error. We want to know if that's statistically significant. So we've got two things to do here. If we've got standard errors available, we can compare that to the calculated RMS 95 to check that our total error is within the error that we would expect from the 95% confidence interval. And if they're not available, then we can compare to a user-defined acceptable error, which might, be, which might be from stakeholder consultation. It might be from the, measure, from the instruments that we're using for the measurements or that we're using to make the um, to provide the observations. But for all of those, we can then compare them. OK, so we've got either the systematic error. If we've got the replicate values, we'll use low fit. If we haven't, we'll calculate the RMSF, RMS or RMSE. And if we've got the standard errors, we can compare them to RMS 95. So we've got a good, robust statistical method there, which we can then test for coincidence. The next step is to look to see if there's a bias in the simulations. Let's just go up one. So coming down from the total error, this is telling us whether the, the total average error is acceptable or not. We then want to know if they're over-predicting or under-predicting. So we test the bias. We calculate the relative error E. Is it statistically significant? And again, we're going through the same process. If we've got standard errors available, we can compare them to the 95% confidence interval of the relative error. If we haven't, we can compare them to a level of acceptable bias, against, again defined by the user. But when we write this up as a paper, we have to remember to specify what these acceptable errors are and how we've defined them. Otherwise, um, people might think that we've fitted those post hoc. OK, so we've done those. Um, uh, coincidence. So we then look at association. Do the measured and simulate, simulated values show the same trend? We calculate R or the R squared. Some people jump straight to this, this stage and just plot observed versus simulated and just plot the R and give the R squared value. I think by doing that, you're missing a huge amount of information that you could be providing that tells you much more about the model behavior. But we should at least do the association. So we calculate R. We see if it's statistically significant by comparing to the F statistic. And then we know whether we've got significant association or not. OK, so with all of those processes, we've got we're testing, um, we're testing error, we're testing uh, coincidence, we're testing association. And we've got all these different measures of where the model's performing well and where it's not performing well. A perfect model will fit all of the measured data and we'll pass all of these tests. More often than not, we'll find that we pass certain tests and we fail other tests. And that tells us a lot about how the model's working. OK, so this is the bit that we already went through that I jumped to accidentally when we're talking to students. So I'm going to leave it there for today because I think I've talked for long enough. And um, I'll take, take, take questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Pete, uh, for an excellent presentation. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. And you can raise your hand by clicking a red button in the bottom. You can see that's an attention tracking. Uh, if you press that one, we know that you have a question. And I will unmute you. Um, so I can see here uh, Lawrence uh, Smith. I think he's having a question. So. Lawrence, you can ask the question now. Um, oh, hi, Pete. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Just, I just wondered with the um, regard to the stakeholder consultation you mentioned when using the um, 
the acceptable error that's uh, the definition of acceptable error with the RMSE. Yeah. Is there any kind of process that you'd recommend for going about that, or is that something that is um, sort of beyond the yeah. remit? Yeah. It's, it's something we've done a couple of times in the past. Um, yeah. Could you just unmute your microphone a sec? I'm oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, it's something we've done in the past both to both to try and define the acceptable error. So, in fact, Jo was involved with a project when she worked at Rothamsted ages and ages ago where they were doing fertilizer recommendation systems and trying to get the model um, better and better, you know, so that you were just trying to minimize the error. And there came a point where talking to the farmers, you know, they sort of said, well, the machine that I use to spread it only spreads it within an accuracy of... I can't remember exactly what it was, but say 10 or 15 kilograms per hectare per kilograms of N per hectare per year. So at that point, there's no point in improving the model further and getting the fertilizer recommendation system better and better because you can't then use that information in the real world. So that's one example. The other example is where we used actually, we used an expert consultation at a meeting we held here in Aberdeen um, in uh, it was probably about six or seven years ago, where we couldn't fully define the probability density functions of all the different model errors, or, sorry, all the different measurement errors. So we asked the people who are actually doing the measurements to provide information on, you know, if you're measuring the temperature at your site or your eddy covariance site, how well do you think you measure that? And for something like temperature, it's really, really tight. You know, you can get that within 0.1 degree. So the variation that you put into the uncertainty analysis around your estimates of temperature are really, really tight. But when you say, um, you know, you've got some estimates of, um, let me think of a good example. Say we've got some, we've got some estimates of previous previous land management. Uh, and then obviously the error is quite a lot bigger. So it's sort of say, well, you know, the farmer told us that it was under grass 20 years ago, but could that have been 25 years ago or 30 years ago? So we've used the stakeholder consultation or expert consultation to try and define the probability density functions to go into sensitivity and uncertainty analysis. But you're more of an expert on this than, than I am, Lawrence. So you would probably have you would probably know um, there are probably better protocols than the ones that we used to try and gather this information that would be more defensible. So have you got any perspectives on that? I was just wondering if like a Delphi type approach could be used, you know, where you're sort of talking to sort of multiple groups of stakeholders and then sort of doing a, um, a a survey, whether it's sort of online or on a spreadsheet or whatever, and you send it, send it out, send out the uh, estimates in an anonymized format uh, to all of the experts uh, and then give them a chance to sort of adjust their estimates until you get to some kind of consensus overall. Um, yeah, I think that would be a valuable approach. I mean, it's the, the, the advantages that that will provide um, are all the things that we probably did wrong when we did, when we did it the other way, you know, where we where we asked people, you know, uh, we didn't anonymize everything. We asked people, they were able to, um, they were able to assess their level of expertise, you know, a self-assessment. But uh, beyond that, I think that, you know, I think that what you've just suggested would, would be much more robust. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Lawrence, um, and thanks, Pete. Uh, we'll go to the next question. It's from uh, uh, Satiria from University of Illinois. Hello, can you hear us? Hello? Okay, then I think I lost the connection. So we'll go to the next one, Nemai Senapati from Indra. Um, Hello, Nimai, can you hear us? Hello? Hello, Nimai, can you hear us? Hello? Hello, Nimai. Can you hear us? I 
I can hear some noise. <laughs> Hello. I think the line is not clear. Um, we got another one, Jagadish. Yes. Um, I'll get to the next question. Uh, Lee Ju, can you hear us? Hello? I was initially, I was in with. Uh, <laughs> Actually, um, okay. Um, yeah. Hello. Hello. Lost the connection. Hello. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Marcelo. Is it my uh, yeah. yeah. Please, please go ahead. Oh uh, sure. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah, and thanks, Pete. For, for the presentation. Uh, I was just going to ask about, you showed error bars on the modeled uh, data points uh, in one of the graphs. So I would appreciate if you could expand on on how are those generated? Um, yeah, when you, uh, and what's good practice about it? Like when you're running an experiment with the measured data, sure, you have replicates and all that. So how would you go about with the modeled runs? Would you do several runs for the same plot or? Yeah, yeah. so I think most of the, plots I showed, yeah, could you kill the mic, please? Yeah, I think most of the plots I showed actually just had the, had the measurement error on them. But you could generate something similar to, to an error if you want the, the model error in there, which you would do as part of the uncertainty analysis when you run the model using, by sampling, all of the different inputs within their potential range. So you'd have a probability density function for all of the different inputs, and you then sample stochastically using a grid search or a Monte Carlo uh, simulation, and you do lots and lots of runs. So that's the only way really to get variation in the model. Most models are deterministic, as you know, so you give them the same inputs and you'll get exactly the same outputs every single time. So in order to get variation within the modeled outputs, then you need to change something. And you usually do that with um, either by changing one, one parameter at a time or more frequently you would do that by stochastic parameter sampling using a Monte Carlo simulation. So you define all of your probability density functions and you take a selection of random parameters from within those, you run the model, you then ask it to do another random selection of parameters from within those distributions and you run the model again and you do that many thousands of times until you get a probability density function of the outputs. So that's the way that we've done it in the past. It's computationally intensive and it takes a while to set up. But when you've done it once, it's much easier to do it again the next time. But that is a good question because it's great to know what your model variation is as well as your measure, measurement variation. And the other important point that it raises that I, forgot to, that I forgot to talk about is that sometimes we try to overfit the model to capture measurements which we're uncertain about. So the measurements are really just, they're an estimate of reality also and the measurements can also be wrong. So overfitting to try and capture a particular point can also be a dangerous thing to do because you know, measurements can be wrong as well as models. Models more frequently, I admit, but measurements can also be wrong. But good question, Marcelo. Uh, the next question is from um, Rob Field. Hello, Rob. Can you hear us? 
Hello. Rob, can you hear us? Okay, I'll go to the uh, Ron here. Hello, Ligu. Can you hear us? Hello. Hello, Magdala. Can you hear us? Hello. Please feel free to ask the questions here. Yeah? Marcelo, can you hear us? I, I can. Yeah, um, do you have any questions? No, I've, I've, I've already asked my question. So. Okay, sorry, it's already on. So if, if there is no questions, um, we can say so thank you to um, Pete. Thank you very much, Pete, for all your time, and I hope you all enjoyed the uh, uh, presentation. And this is recorded and it will be posted on uh, Gram next week. Um, I'm sorry for the bad line. Uh, some of you want to ask the questions, uh, but due to the bad line, we, we can't, couldn't connect you all. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. If anyone has any questions that they want to email me, I'll be happy to respond to them yeah. independently. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks Pete. Yeah. If you have any questions, please uh, contact uh, Pete over email. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.